Well, I'm going to switch now from cognition to emotion. And the puzzle of language that I'll start with comes from a, an event uh, five years ago when NBC broadcasted the Golden Globe Awards on live television. And accepting an award on behalf of the group U2, Bono said, and I quote, this is really, really fucking brilliant. <laughs> now, the network did not bleep out the offending word. The switchboards lit up. And the case went to the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, which has jurisdiction over the airwaves. In considering the matter, they decided not to find the network. Because according to their guidelines, indecency is, quote, material that describes or depicts sexual or excretory organs or activities. And the fucking and fucking brilliant is an adjective or expletive to emphasize an exclamation. <laughs> well, a number of... Uh, conservative politicians were enraged. And they filed legislation designed to close this loophole. Uh, I downloaded uh, one of these bills from the US congressional website. Uh, and I'm going to read it to you right now. House Resolution 3687, the Clean Airwaves Act. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that Section 1464 of Title 18, the United States Code, is amended. One, by inserting A before whoever. And two, the term profane, used with respect to language, includes the words shit, piss, fuck, cunt, asshole, and the phrases cocksucker, motherfucker, and asshole. Compound use, including hyphenated compounds of such words and phrases, with each other or with other words or phrases, and other grammatical forms of such words and phrases, including verb, adjective, gerund, participle, and infinitive forms. <laughs> Unfortunately, the fucking and fucking brilliant is an adverb, and that's the one part of speech they forgot to include on the list. <laughs> so the puzzle is, why do people get so upset about hearing certain words? It's not as if any adult has not heard the words before. And indeed, this isn't just a scientific puzzle, but it's a, a legal puzzle. In fact, the use of uh, these words has been the main legal battleground of free speech for most of the past century, including a Supreme Court case due to come up uh, next month in October, dealing with the fallout of Bono's fleeting, expletive, uh, fleeting expletive. Well, to understand, to solve this puzzle, you have to know something about the language of swearing, including the cognitive neuroscience of swearing. What happens in the brain when a person hears or says a taboo word? And the first generalization is that taboo words activate brain areas associated with negative emotion. These include the right hemisphere, which is more involved in negative emotion than the left. In production, uh, they involve the basal ganglia, which, is a, which are a complex set of nuclei buried uh, deep uh, within the brain uh, that are responsible for packaging and inhibiting sequences of behavior, and which are probably the cause of the malfunction that leads to Tourette's syndrome, in particular the symptom in which people will sometimes involuntarily blurt out obscene expressions. In perception, taboo words light up the amygdala, uh, a, an almond-shaped organ also buried deeply within the brain, one on each side, which ordinarily responds to threatening stimuli, such as an angry face or a dangerous animal. The second generalization is that taboo words are processed involuntarily. You can't hear or read a taboo word without registering uh, what it means, including the negative emotion that clings to it. That is, you can't treat a taboo word as just a buzz of sound, nor can you treat the printed version as a bunch of squiggles on a page. The brain can't help but register its meaning. Now, when psychologists want to show that something is processed automatically by the brain, they use a technique called the Stroop test. It's familiar to any, every psychology undergraduate, and it's been the subject of more than 4,000 scientific papers. Uh, but it's really rather simple. The task is simply to name the color in which each word on a list is printed. That is, don't read the word. Just look at the ink that it's printed in and name the color of the ink. And I'm going to try it with you right now. For every word that I flash right now, simply say aloud the color in which the word is printed. Okay? Red. Okay, easy. Uh, I'm going to give you another list. Do the exact same thing. Name the color in which the word is printed. Uh, 
much, much harder. Uh, that's because the word is printed. It, the word spells out a color that differs from the one that it's printed in, and you can't turn off the circuit in the brain that actually reads what the word spells out. Well, here's a third version of the Stroop test. Um, uh, different words, same task. Just name the color in which the word is printed. Black. Green. Uh, this is the experiment was done by Donald Mackay at UCLA, and uh, people are slowed down in this version of the task almost as much as when the word spells out the wrong color. Uh, and uh, what this tells us is that uh, we can think of swearing as the use of language as a weapon to force a listener to think an unpleasant or at least an emotionally charged thought. And that <clears throat> divides the puzzle of swearing into two puzzles. Uh, first, what kinds of concepts trigger negative emotions in the minds of listeners? And why would a speaker want to trigger a negative emotion in the mind of uh, his listeners? And I'll discuss each of these uh, in turn. Uh, let me start with the content of swearing. Anyone who speaks more than one language knows that the uh, literal meaning of swear words differs from language to language. If you translate the swear words of one language into another, uh, it doesn't quite have the same effect. Nonetheless, scholars who look at taboo words across the world's languages note that they fall into a small number of categories, each of them associated with a negative emotion. There are many taboo words, for example, for supernatural uh, beings, such as our own curses, damn hell and Jesus Christ. Uh, these have lost a lot of their uh, wallop, uh, but they are still potent in traditionally religious societies, such as many Catholic societies. I grew up in Quebec. And in Quebecois French, the worst thing that you can shout out is a cursed chalice. Uh, as I said, loses something in translation. Uh, and these words evoke the emotions of awe and fear of the, at the power of supernatural entities. There are many taboo words for bodily effluvia and the organs that secrete them. Uh, you all know what they are. I don't have to uh, read the list. Uh, and it's not surprising that we have strong emotions in response to these words, because epidemiologists tell us that bodily effluvia are major vectors of disease. Many parasites and infectious diseases are spread by hitching a ride on uh, human uh, excreta. Uh, and uh, we've evolved an emotion that pr uh, protects us against this root of infection, the emotion of disgust. And that's what these words can trigger. There are many taboo words for disease, death, and infirmity themselves, as in the old curses, a pox on you, or a plague on both your houses, or the uh, curse in Polish uh, and in Yiddish, cholera. cholera. Uh, in fact, there's even a bit of taboo that clings to the name of our most dreaded malady, cancer, and one often reads in an obituary that so-and-so passed away from a long illness. Uh, both the word die and the word cancer uh, are considered taboo, and they're replaced by euphemisms. And the, that's because these words emo evoke the emotion of dread at death and disease. There are many taboo words in many languages surrounding sexuality. Again, uh, you all know the English ones. I won't read them aloud. Uh, and at this point, many people ask, well, how does this fit into the theory that uh, taboo language evokes negative emotions? Isn't sexuality a source of uh, mutual pleasure? Well, it can be when it's done between consenting adults, but there's a much wider range of uh, circumstances in which uh, people are involved in sexuality, such as exploitation, illegitimacy, incest, jealousy, spousal abuse, cuckoldry, desertion, feuding, harassment, and rape. It's not surprising that people the world over should have strong reactions when it comes to sex, which we can call revulsion at sexual depravity. Finally, there are many taboo words for disfavored people in groups, for infidels, cripples, enemies, subordinated peoples, such as the worst swear word in contemporary American English, which is not the S word nor the F word, but the N word, nigger one of uh, a set of offensive terms for racial and ethnic minorities. And these words evoke the emotions of hatred and contempt. Well, those are some of the negative emotions that words can arouse. But that leads to the question, why do people want to press those emotion buttons in other people? 